We are here today with Marit Schularek, who is Professor of Economics and Economic History at the Free University of Berlin, a grantee from INET doing interesting research on debt, private debt, on, for many countries over a long period of time and how that affects the real economy. Welcome. Thank you. Could you tell us a bit about what the nature of your research is and the grant you're doing for INET? Right. So our grant is uh, called uh, Finance and the Welfare of Nations, The View from Economic History. It's joined with Alan Taylor from the uh, University of Virginia and Oscar Jorda from uh, UC Davis. Uh, we, we, what the general idea is to use macroeconomic history um, and empirical methods, marry them, bring them together, and um, then be in a position to say more about very crucial and important policy questions, such as what's the relation between finance and growth? What's the role of financial factors in the business cycle? Um, and you know, what are the costs and, and, uh, uh, of financial crises? And those are very important issues today, uh, but what is the evidence that you're going to be looking at to assess those questions? Right. Well, part of the project is to collect data, and I think that's representative of the, the way we like to do sort of empirical macroeconomics is to reach back in time and, 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 and have a broader picture, to use long-run uh, cross-country data sets. Specifically, we want to um, see and, and, and you know, go to uh, statistical publications, uh, or possibly also uh, to archives and um, find long-run series for real estate lending, for lending to business, lending to households. Um, this reflects one important gap in the literature, which is we don't have an awful lot of uh, disaggregated credit data. Are there countries that you can get that kind of disaggregated data? Like well, going that, back very far, right? For some countries, it's not. It will be possible. I can for Germany, uh, the data um, situation is relatively good. For the U.S., I think we're hopeful to um, get more a uh, granular series, at least as far back as 1896, when um, most statistical uh, collections start. One of the historical comparisons uh, that has been done in recent years is done by. Rogoff and Reinhardt in looking back at credit issues and, and economic performance. How does your research differ from their research? Our work is similar to theirs in spirit. Our focus though is on uh, private credit. So uh, uh, Carmen and Ken looked at public debt and what we add to that literature is detailed annual private credit data. Uh, I think both Ireland and, and to some degree Spain illustrate the fact that it is actually what drives lending booms and what causes financial instability is very often the private sector. It's unsustainable lending booms in the housing sector or maybe an overinvestment uh, driven by, by corporations that get very optimistic about the future and at some point these um, um, investments and, and the loans that uh, we're used to finance these investments go bad. You wouldn't capture that just looking at public debt. I, I would even say it's the private sector that's at the heart of the question of what role finance and credit plays, leverage plays in the macroeconomy. And what has led you to believe that you would have even better understanding if you had a breakdown of the types of private credit? That's where the link comes into sort of the, the title of our project, Finance and the Welfare of Nations, is that um, the economic functions played by lending differ substantially that you know it's it's not absolute it's, it's not the same thing whether a bank extends credit to a company for productive investment or whether a household borrows from a bank to finance the purchase of an already existing house or an already existing apartment right one is uh, is linked positively linked with uh, economic growth and development the other one is a financial transaction that from a consumer point of view might seem beneficial, but it's much less clear you know, what the welfare implications are of these housing booms. So you'll also be looking at whether investment was occurring that would improve the capacity to repay the debt later. Right. That's a crucial focus of um, going beyond the aggregate credit data will be to, um, as far as possible, trying to distinguish between lending and debt that was used for productive purposes productive investment as, you know, to the degree we can, this is part, we can define that, um, and lending that went into a construction, which, you know, is, is necessary and good, but went into mortgage uh, lending, etc., to see whether 
there are different uh, economic um, implications. Consumer lending being the third category, for example. So let's talk a bit about how you became an economist. What, in your early studies, what, what were you, were you, did you start out thinking as a young person that you always wanted to be an economist? Um, I, I, you know, I had, I had always an inter interest in history and in economics. It was sort of, I did a double my undergrad studies, both in economics and history. But I have to admit, I came more from the historical side and over time became more and more interested in, in, um, in sort of macroeconomic theory and then did my PhD in, 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 in economics. I think there are important policy lessons to be learned um, from, from looking at history. And there's a lot that history has to tell us for, um, for policy questions that we try to solve right now. Uh, to give you an example, when the financial crisis struck in 2007, 2008, um, you know, there wasn't that much that macroeconomics textbooks had, had to say about it. Um, the financial sector wasn't in them. So as textbooks went out of the window, people in, you know, at the Federal Reserve, Ben Bernanke and others, looked to economic history. And, and when that model uncertainty is very high, people, we need to become more empirical um, be more inductive than, than purely deductive and, and f look at economic history. You have things to learn from e episodes that were long ago and how they developed. But how do you deal with the question of uh, that it was so different 70 years ago, 140 years ago in, in doing your economic history? Well, two answers. One is um, actually exact only by going back so far in time. We see these structural breaks. And the other, the other answer is when we do cross-country comparisons, we also have to deal with these structural differences between uh, countries. And there are ways, empirical methods, to control for such effects. And uh, I think this is something that, um, that I and, and, and Oscar and Alan would also underline. It is important for an economic historian today that it's, you, know, we, you use state-of-the-art empirical methods. And, if there is something that possibly also an older generation of economic historians contributed to that decline of economic history in, in, in economic departments around the world, it could have been that um, when economics took that mathematical formal turn in the past 20, 30 years, um, you know, old, older economic historians were not willing to um, you know, to, to stay up to date with the empirical methods. Great. Thank you very much for coming in today and talking to us about your research and your background and your policy ideas. Welcome to the INET community and we're pleased that you're one of our grantees. Thank you very much. <laughs>